almost uh, every day nearby the university where I work, outside a grocery store. I see an old lady, and she's sitting there in ragged clothes, wearing a scarf around her neck, smiling and greeting customers who pass her by in the freezing cold. She's begging for money. And lately, I've been trying to notice how do people interact with this woman. Now, most, they uh, put their hands in their pockets or look down at the ground or up at the sky as if she's not there. Some take out their wallet and uh, drop a coin or a bill into her cup, but then move on uh, hurriedly, seeming almost embarrassed. But then, one day, the lady shifted her strategy. She did something clever. She started to knit winter hats and mittens for sale. And now, the vibe around her shifted. People stopped more often. Some bought what she had for sale, a growing stock of mittens and hats. But also, quite a few just stopped to interact. They spoke with her, uh, chit-chatted, even though they didn't even share the same language. So, what happened here? Why was it that people were more prone, more likely, to stop and interact, talk, when the woman had something for sale, and would move on, almost embarrassed, feel discomfortable when she had been begging. I'm a social anthropologist, and um, I've done field research, and I've lived uh, in many places across the world, from Cuba to southern Africa, from southern Spain to Norway. And I noticed something that I think is interesting, that anywhere you find poor people, you find these same inventive strategies that try to nudge the wealthy into parting with some of their incomes by providing a small item for sale or a service. Why is that? Drug addicts, people with drug problems, young and old, Men and women roam urban streets in affluent cities selling magazines. I'm sure you've seen these. Magazines that quite a few people buy, but let's be honest, not that many people read. And I'm sure if, you, if you've been in affluent homes, you may have seen these magazines laying on a ca coffee table, mostly unread. This, I'm, I'm willing to bet you that the same goes for the uh, hats and the mittens that the old lady had for sale. Right now, if you go into the affluent home surrounding this grocery store, how many unused winter hats and mittens will you find laying around unused? We're talking about a global phenomenon here. I was recently in Havana, Cuba, where I do my research working among taxi drivers, and there you found a similar pattern. In the busiest intersection in Havana, nearby the port, upon the red light, an old man would step into the street and start washing the car window with a dirty cloth. And this service was, to be honest, worse than useless. Because the more the man washed my car window, the dirtier it actually got. Nonetheless, as a driver, I would feel a certain pull towards giving him something, pulling out a bill or a little coin, handing it out the window, and then get the hell out of there. It's a clever move. You have to give it to him. It's a move I also found in Lesotho, Southern Africa. I remember I rented a car towards the end of my stay, and I drove to the grocery store where there would be these huge, empty parking lots. 
And as I was backing up, out of nowhere, seemingly, one, two, three young men would appear and start enthusiastically waving and directing my parking. As informal parking assistants, they provided a service that I did not need, but which I nonetheless found it difficult not to pay for. And that is the magic trick. It seems that poor people across the world have understood that it's clever to provide a service or sell an item rather than to simply beg for money, even though people don't actually need this service. So why is this the case? What's going on here? Let's pick it apart. We need to understand why. One, it's so uncomfortable for many people to give to beggars or to interact with beggars. What is it about begging that makes people feel uncomfortable? And two, what is it about the small commercial services that almost magically makes the poor appear more dignified, more worthy of interaction in the eyes of the wealthy? I've done some digging around, and ever since the Middle Ages, in fact, the figure of the beggar has provoked strong reactions among politicians, writers, intellectuals, everyone. Martin Luther, the famous reformer of Christianity, edited a book that I found. It came out in 1528 called The Book of Vagabonds and Beggars, in which he warns the princes, dukes, lords and everyone to be clever and careful in their dealings with beggars, because despite their appearances, they were actually desperate crooks. This skepticism towards beggars was the political mainstream for the next centuries in Europe. Authorities punished beggars by whipping them, by imprisoning them, or forcing them to work in labor camps. Still today, across a number of industrialized countries, like the UK, Denmark, Greece, Austria, the authorities consider begging a crime. Why is that? I find it curious that throughout history, and still today, we have such a deep issue with the figure of the beggar. Because, remember, it's not exactly that beggars make people who pass by or people who engage with them on the street go broke. In fact, if I would have told you that on your way to this event, you would um, have dropped a $5 bill, a 5 euro bill or whatever, on the ground, on the ground, that is, and not into a beggar's cup, how would you react? Likely with a shrug of the shoulders, not too much of a big deal. In other words, the problem that people have with begging doesn't have financial causes. It's not a financial problem. There are social causes behind here. Now, what does that mean? Well, the first problem for beggars is the type of social relationship that they invite you into. Picture this, you're on your way to the grocery store from work, and you're thinking about what you're going to get for dinner. And then, suddenly, a stranger, a complete stranger, sitting on the ground, jolts you out of your existence, asking you for what? For a gift. Now, unlike commodities, which are the goods that we buy inside the grocery store, gifts are very particular things. Because gifts come with this implicit, we all know this, this implicit expectation that you give something back at a later stage. Gifts circulate, and this circulation is what creates friendship, 
lasting social bonds, alliances of many kinds. But the gifts that beggars ask for are different. It's an unreturned gift, right? Because they're asking you to give you to give them something, but they can't give anything back. And the unreturned gift, this one-way gift, is an unfamiliar one. It's a strange one. And it's also one that we think humiliates the one who receives. So part of the problem for beggars, part of the discomfort that people feel when faced with beggars comes from this. They are complete strangers asking you to give them an unreturned and what many consider an humiliating gift. So that's the gift problem. The second problem for beggars is that they appear passive. By just sitting there, it seems as if they're doing nothing. And this is a problem because they're, by doing apparently nothing, they're challenging a key assumption in almost any political economic system that we can think of. And that's the assumption that human beings become valuable, we acquire dignity and worth by working. In capitalist society, men and women are supposed to sell their labor on the market, right? We uh, have our coffee in the morning, go off to work, get our pay slips, come home, maybe stop by the grocery store on our way back, and repeat the cycle again and again indefinitely. This is how we acquire value as human beings. In communist society, each member is supposed to work according to their ability and receive according to their need, right? In the Soviet Union, the constitution literally stated that he who does not work shall not eat. Because work is such a fundamental part of how we perceive human beings to acquire value, begging is in principle a provocative act. Their apparent unwillingness to work makes them provocative, makes them problematic to people on their way to or from work. Of course, the elderly lady sitting outside the grocery store selling mittens and hats, she knew all this. She knew that people would have a problem with giving her an unreturned and what many consider a humiliating gift. She knew also that by just sitting there, people would consider her less worthy. So she came up with a solution. By setting up these small commercial services, knitting, washing car windows that need no washing, selling roses on the street, the poor change an uncomfortable gift relationship into one that feels more equal for us. Now, many people pity beggars, right? But by setting up these services, by doing these things, it's almost as if the poor take pity on us. As if they're saying, okay, so my misery, my poverty is making you feel uncomfortable. How about this? How about we play a game? I'll give you something, whatever, a mitten, a magazine, what have you. And then you give me something in return. How about that? Does that make you feel better? They turn an uncomfortable gift relationship into one that feels more equal. By selling stuff, they also do something about the second problem. They're showing us 
that they're willing to work and thus appear more worthy, more acceptable in the eyes of people who pass them by. They're actually performing for us. And when you start to look, you'll find that the world is full of these hoops that we, the wealthy, make the poor jump through just so that we could feel better about our interaction. When I was doing field research in Lesotho, Southern Africa, I worked with um, local non-governmental organizations. And the local NGO workers, they had learned this language, this jargon of calling themselves partners to the funding organizations in the global north. Partners and never recipients of aid. They had to kind of pretend that there was no hierarchy between donor organizations in the north, in some of the richest areas of the world, and themselves scrambling to get by in one of the poorest. In private conversations backstage, they would say things to me like, hey, we really just need their funds. We really just need the aid, their help. But in public, in reports, in meetings, they would learn to use this jargon of equal exchange, of wanting trade, not aid, and always of refraining from taking handouts. Think about that for a second, just so that the donors in the North could feel a bit better about the interaction. Like the NGO workers of the Global South, beggars of the world must cater to the feelings of rich people. It's a grotesque irony because, almost unlike any other social group, beggars have been stigmatized as passive and unintelligent. Yet the reality is the opposite. By setting up small services, by knitting, washing car windows, selling roses, the poor act strategically and intelligently. They massage the cultural prejudices of the rich. Because they know, intuitively, they know that their mere presence, their poverty, makes rich people feel uncomfortable. Because they remind us that the world is an ugly place. That there are hierarchies in this world, and even worse, that we who roam the streets of affluent cities are actually implicated in these hierarchies. So, by knitting, by selling magazines, by washing car windows, the poor offer us a momentary make-believe world. A little sense of comfort, of equality, in a world that is actually deeply uncomfortable and unequal, just so that we perhaps, just perhaps, can share a tiny drop of that massive pool of wealth that the poor have been robbed of before we walk off, get on with our day, and think about nicer things. Thank you. <laughs>